Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Donna McInerney, and I'm the CEO of the Foundation for Educational Administration, which is the professional learning arm for NJPSA. So I want to thank you for joining us today, and I want to take a quick minute to thank you for all that you're doing for New Jersey students. Um, at NJPSA and FEA, we realize just what kind of a workload you're carrying, and we are grateful for what you're doing. We're also grateful today to have a terrific guest, Michael Selbst, to join us today. Um, and I want to give a, a big thank you to Barbara Gantwork for organizing this and putting this together around a very important topic, um, ESY remote learning for students with significant needs. So thank you to Barbara. And I'm going to ask Barbara to introduce our guest today. OK, thank you, Donna. Um, here at NJPSA, under the leadership of Donna and, and Pat Wright, we've been really focused on providing information to all of you as quickly as we can regarding the current issues that you're facing during this uh, pandemic and, and school closure. And one of the particular issues that we know we are dealing with then is providing services to our students with disabilities and the particular issues that uh, you're facing with ensuring good services and participation and engagement of our students with the most significant disabilities. So um, today's program does focus exactly on that. And uh, while we know that there are new guidelines that will allow districts to determine whether or not they can, in a safe and healthy way, provide services in person to students with disabilities during the summer, it's likely that many programs will remain uh, programs that are remote. And even so, all of what uh, Dr. Selps is going to be talking about today is relevant whether or not you're providing a remote or an in-person program. Now, just some housekeeping details for today. Um, you uh, will be uh, muted, you, and you are able to write your questions in the question box. We're going to be monitoring those. And at the end of our session today, which is about four o'clock, we're going to take some of those questions and ask uh, Dr. Selps to, to address them. Also, by tomorrow, uh, probably tomorrow, you'll receive an email providing the link to this webinar. The webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the PowerPoint as well. So um, remember, write your questions in the question box. And now I just want to tell you how pleased I am that Dr. Selps is with us today. Uh, Dr. Selps is the Executive Director of Behavior Therapy Associates in Somerset, New Jersey. He's a licensed psychologist in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. He's a certified school psychologist and a board certified behavior analyst. He also serves as the co-director of the High Step Summer Skills Program, and he has an enormous amount of experience providing uh, services, evaluating and treating preschool age children all the way to adults. He's done many workshops for us we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Selps do many workshops for us here at NJPSA, and he's done them locally in other districts, nationally as well as internationally. Um, he has co-authored authored the Behavior Problems Resource Kit. He has developed the uh, Social Skills Curriculum, Power Solving, a chapter in the book, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. It's a very long resume, but I think what it tells us and what I know is how qualified and experienced he is and how pleased we are to have Dr. Seltz with us today for this webinar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Seltz. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you, Donna and Sal, who's working behind the scenes on the technical front. I appreciate the support there. So uh, it's wonderful to have such a great uh, group it's turned out we've got about 200 people already that have signed on. And as Barbara mentioned, I'll be speaking until about four o'clock and then we'll entertain some Q&A, which you can post your questions through the, uh, the question box on, um, on the webinar site. 
there's a lot of information in a short period of time, so hopefully you can uh, understand that we're not going to get through every slide necessarily or with all the detail. My hope and goal is to be able to convey some information that you'll find that's valuable and helpful for you as you're navigating continuously uh, amidst this pandemic. And while things have changed, there remains quite a bit of uncertainty, uh, not just this summer, not just for September, but you know, day in and day out, even until you get to the point where ESY begins. So we'll talk about some best practices that hopefully, again, will guide you as you go through this. My email is also on the front slide here. And as Barbara mentioned, you'll receive a copy of the PowerPoint. So if you have some questions or concerns that weren't addressed today, then you can feel free to reach out to me and I'll do my best to respond to that. In terms of agenda, so we live within unpredictable times. And one of the things that my colleagues and I have been trying to convey within our practice and to others that amidst there being such uncertainty, what we try to do is to find some degree of certainty. And the certainty is that which we can control as best we can and that which we can convey to our families with whom we work and our students. And then again, that remains quite a challenge, but we'll talk a little bit about that unpredictability. We'll talk about how we can foster success throughout remote learning. And again, a lot of that is very applicable if you're gonna be in person. Talk about briefly managing challenging behavior. And likewise, how do we foster healthy socialization among our students, which in some ways is easier as we're able to get out, but also it carries with it a host of challenges and questions regarding how do we do that and what is safe and healthy in that regard. Hopefully we'll have some time, at least I'll give you a teaser on some of the self-care because self-care is important across the board, whether it's for yourselves, listening, the families that you may work with, colleagues, students with whom we work as well. So uh, we'll wanna talk about that and address that. So think about this as I scroll through some questions, whether you've asked any of these questions yourself or thinking about this, and I imagine many of them would be a check. Yes, when can we go back to school safely? This remote teaching, gosh, it's pretty challenging for me and for our students and the families. It's pretty difficult to get parents and students to participate, to get them to onboard and to, to show up. It's disheartening to observe the student's behavior without being able to stop it. So I consult to some schools that have students with significant behavior issues and to observe self injurious behavior for some students, aggressive behavior towards a family member. How can I continue to juggle all of my professional responsibilities with my personal responsibilities and at the same time remain calm and sane and being able to manage all of this? Really, this is going to continue through ESY? Well, I guess that depends, right? It depends on what your district does. It depends on what your role may be. Uh, so there's uncertainty. What about for our children? What might they be thinking? In many ways, not necessarily much different. I don't even understand what coronavirus is. Well, the secret is the adults many times don't understand it much better. There's information we hear from the CDC one day and that may change a, a different day. What we hear from leaders you know, uh, politically may change from one day to the next and there's lots of different information. So what does it really mean? I'm worried that I might get sick. My friends, my colleagues, my family members, they may get sick, what will we do? Gosh, we're so bored. Where can we go safely? How can we handle this? I know that there are families that have literally not stepped foot out of their door over the last three months, even to get fresh air because of uh, a real genuine concern they have that just stepping outside could lead to them getting coronavirus. I don't know when I can go back to more traditional school and sports and music lessons and scouting in the mall. Gosh, the professional sports can't figure it out and they've got billions of dollars and here we are trying to figure that out within your local town and within your school and the question marks so the kids don't know. How can I learn without my teacher in the room? It's become the parent in the room and that's difficult. When will I see my friends again? And how can I also juggle all of this and remain calm? A question the kids are asking. We think about parents and many of you listening as an educator may have the additional role and hat as a parent. And I've seen that many times firsthand with some of the video conferences that I've done, the kids and pets and so forth coming in and out and, and other family members. Well, many parents have never served the role of instructor or instructional assistant. 
and they may have what we call dirty socks, which is a pretty cool acronym that my uh, graduate school professor, Stanley Rosner, had, um, I don't know if he coined it, but it, it kind of left a, a reminder, you know, for many years for me. So we know that many parents are lacking the skills, the objectivity, the confidence and knowledge to successfully educate their child at home, particularly when there are challenging behaviors, when there are developmental delays, when there are academic difficulties, and when they may have difficulty just navigating the technology that we're all becoming more and more adept at. And parents may find that the time that's needed, the support that's needed, is significantly greater than they can manage. And probably for many of you, likewise, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting thing. I what I was hearing from from teachers initially was, well, I probably will have a lot more time on my hands. And I think initially for many educators that was the case. And then it became, I have no time on my hands because the demands are increasing, and the technology demands are also increasing. I need to videotape myself and then run a lesson. I need to provide individual lessons or group lessons, and we need to have some way of monitoring and assessing. And it became even more challenging and more time consuming. So for parents struggling parenting a child and educating a child, and for educators educating students in your class, but also parenting your own kids at home and other responsibilities. Gosh, I just want to empathize for a moment how difficult that can be. And for us to empathize with what parents are experiencing, which again, I know many of you do know firsthand. What are some quick tips? So one of the things that we really want to stress, even though we know we're several months into this, and we'd like to think that parents by now are pros, I think you guys would know better than I that many parents are just absolutely burned out. Many educators are burned out. Students are burned out at this point of having done this for several months. And the idea of whether we're returning physically in person in New Jersey to school during ESY or gonna be remote depending upon the district and all the different circumstances. One of the important things is have what are the expectations? What is happening tomorrow morning? What is happening later today? We wanna help parents to ensure that they can have some real clarity that they can explain to their child about what to expect for the day of school, whether remotely or in person. And that's gonna come a lot from an educator to share with the parents, here's what we're doing. Here's when school starts. The more we can help parents to help their child to have the mindset that it's school time, I'm showing up. And what does that look like? And literally what I would recommend is that we want the child to bring their backpack, if they're working remotely, bring that to the table. Let's get the backpack set up the night before, just like as if it would be the in-person school day the next day. What do you need in there? You need your laptop, you need your iPad, you need your Chromebook, you need to have writing materials, your calculator, your book, whatever it may be. Let's get things charged and ready and prepared. What does your schedule look like so that when that morning turns over and you're waking up, we're ready to go. And let's get changed from those pajamas into the school clothes. And you may say, oh yeah, good luck with that. Well, the reality is we wanna set the stage for success, helping the child and the parent to be in the mindset that it's time to go. It's time for school, let's move. Whether it's from bed to the, the desk, from bed to the kitchen table, wherever it is, we're gonna look presentable, we're going to change that mindset to be ready that I'm showing up for school. So I'd strongly recommend that here's the expectation that we have for you and making sure the parents understand that so they can prep their child. Let's pick out those clothes the night before or the morning of. Let's eat breakfast. Here are the expectations. First, we're doing this. Then we're doing that. Then we're doing this. And here's the next thing. And one of the toughest things I find that, and this is connected with challenging behavior, is that we don't want to be giving children access to highly preferred activities and items prior to getting them to show up for remote learning or going to school. That means getting a child off an iPad or watching YouTube or playing a video game is a lot harder than having them show up and participate and then they can earn that time. So paying them forward only works if you have a child that can reliably and consistently Follow that expectation of being present and participating and cooperating fully for academic instruction, transitioning, whether it's to a physical school building or working remotely. So the recommendation would be to encourage parents to hold off 
and giving the child access to those highly preferred activities until after they're completely done the school. There could be breaks in between, which is certainly um, feasible and important, but it shouldn't be those highly preferred items that make it really difficult for the child to get off of. What should we target during ESY? Well, that's not really my decision. That's an IEP team decision, but really ESY extended school year time is the opportunity to ensure that we have maintenance of mastered skills. It's not really the opportunity that we're looking to teach new skills, but to minimize and manage potential regression and extended uh, potential for recouping those skills. So a good place to start is to look at those mastered skills that are really important, but also to collaborate with parents and say, hey, look, we've got the next four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. What does this look like? What would be helpful to you? And we can be identifying things like you know, socialization and looking at daily living skills that are critical. We can be looking at some pre-vocational or vocational skills for some of the older children. We can be looking at some functional play skills and imaginative play, interactive play. So what are skills that the parent can be present for and help the child to maintain and to generalize that's going to make for an enjoyable, engaging summer? and also manageable for you as an educator and manageable for the parent at home. So engaging in that conversation early, enough time prior to ESY would be ideal. Focusing on skills the child has already mastered, for example, playing a game, but now we're gonna work on generalizing that to playing with a sibling or playing with a friend. Maybe they've mastered doing some laundry skills and, and some of the fine motor or gross motor, but we're gonna apply that to helping with the laundry or they've mastered some functional academic skills like counting and one-to-one -one correspondence, and they're gonna help with making the table, uh, getting the table ready for dinner and counting how many forks and knives and spoons and plates and cups we need. So looking at ways that are gonna be practical application to that is critical. Rules, routines, and reinforcement. So kind of the three R's here. Really, really critical so that we can, again, set up for success. We wanna minimize the likelihood of problems. Whether we're physically in a classroom or working remotely, your role as an educator could be to help the child, if they're in your classroom, help the parent where the child is working remotely, to have some visual cues. When we think about learners who have significant developmental delays, or even if not significant, we know that many individuals learn through multi-sensory approach. So providing the combination of visual supports, textual cues, as you see in this middle slide here, you could have the textual cue of breakfast and greeting, and here are the activities, and a visual that goes along with it. On the right side, there's a mini clock and a morning routine, math, read aloud. We could have a countdown timer. Think about what you might use in your classroom and see if you can give those tools to the parent. There are many, many tools and strategies that, and visuals that can be downloaded for free uh, or that you could scan and send and share with the parents so they could print out, they can use Google Images or any other um, you know, site and printing out some of those images in, in a Word document is a great way to just make a pretty simple, straightforward visual schedule, which can be really helpful. We encourage parents also to be very clear and specific. So the more you can communicate that in your work and with parents and in your work, work as an educator, let's be real clear about the expectations, not we'll see, not in a couple minutes, but in two minutes, when the timer goes off, when the bell rings, when the red color goes away, so that the child and parent can have an expectation of when this activity ends, when the next activity begins. If we can minimize that vagueness, we should get greater compliance and fewer behavioral challenges that exist. I would encourage you as educators, and also if you're thinking about it from the parent hat perspective, is to have a nightly planning meeting. This will look a little bit different for learners whose skills are higher functioning compared to those that are lower functioning, meaning there'll be more language for a learner that's higher and a learner that's lower functioning and their cognitive language skills will probably build into it more visuals. But let's plan for what does it look like? What will your day look like? Come back to that visual schedule. What are the expectations? So we're gonna do some work and then we're gonna do some physical activity. We're gonna do some work and then maybe we have a break. Work and then there's gonna be some reinforcement activity that happens after that. So let's plan so that parent educator and child are all on the same page. To be clear, I'm not suggesting the educator has a call with the parent the night before, but the educator and the parent are communicating and collaborating. What are the expectations for tomorrow and this week? 
so that the parent can communicate with their child what are the expectations for tomorrow and this week and have a visual board so we can see what that looks like. And that way we can really foster not only good communication and collaboration, but increasing the likelihood of success. I would encourage you also to praise not only parents, but instructional assistants. And if you're here as an instructional assistant to give positive feedback to the other assistants, positive feedback to the staff, to parents. In other words, there's a lot of good that we can spread. You know, I, I, I recognize the challenges that you have in your role. We wanna recognize that among one another and find opportunities to give very behavior specific praise about how we're doing, how things are progressing. When we think about reinforcement and what goes along with that, having a specific plan, when you do this, then this will happen, crystal clear. The more you can be clear, the better. Not, we'll see when you can have your time on your iPad, or we'll see whether or not we go to the park or the pool. Make it very clear, and if you can convey that to parents to come up with a very concrete plan, here are the child's expectations, here are the parent's expectations, Here's what the child will do, and here's what the parent will do as a result of that. If as an educator, if you're delivering the reinforcement, same thing. What are the expectations for the child? And as parent or, or as educator, how will you deliver that reinforcement so that everybody knows what to expect? We also want to be thinking about how we can place some of that responsibility internally more and more on the child, meaning we want to shift the mindset so the child can start to internalize what do I need to do instead of being dependent upon verbal prompts or other prompts. Verbal prompts and other prompts can be very difficult to fade as we're going through a, a, an educational program. So if we can ask a child like, what is the rule for dot, 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 or what do you need when you're getting ready for your class, or what will happen after Ms. Smith has done the educational uh, or the math lesson or the reading lesson. What are we doing tomorrow? So you're asking some leading, some guiding questions. We call that Socratic questioning, taking the child to where they need to be instead of telling them or doing it for them. There's a lot more learning that ultimately happens if we can shape and gradually move there versus telling them specifically what they need to do. So more sometimes is less, less sometimes is more. So if we can minimize the prompting, we can really shape a lot more behavior. Again, be clear, let's avoid saying we'll see, be a lot more specific. You can also encourage parents when they think about reinforcement and access to preferred activities or items, not to have everything taken away. Well, you're giving your teacher a hard time, so you've lost all your YouTube or all of your video game or TV time for the rest of the week, and you can't play or go swimming for the rest of the week. Well, gosh, if it's Tuesday morning, what are we doing the rest of the week for reinforcement if that's needed for that child? We would do better, again, to have the when, then. When this happens, then this happens. First you do this, then this happens, versus the child having access and then taking everything away, which is just not typically a very uh, effective intervention. How can we help students to sit calmly, attend better, complete work? Well, if you just think for a moment about some of the learners who are more significantly impaired in their functioning levels, even just showing up as we're doing and making eye contact as I'm making and squaring the body, sitting in a, in a chair and sitting calmly with hands still, that's a tremendous challenge for many students, even when we're in person, in a classroom, sitting across from them with reinforcement. So now you take the technology of looking through a, a camera, a web camera, and some students don't even completely comprehend what does that mean? I now see my teacher and I've been seeing my teacher and it's like a, a picture or a video, but are they real? Is it really live? What does that mean? Yes, even several months later, still struggling with that. So what we really encourage is if you haven't developed some real good rapport or we call it pairing with the student, is that may be really important to revisit during extended school year programming, especially if you're working with a learner that you haven't worked with before. And by pairing or rapport building, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to align with or connect with that student so that we can become reinforcing in and of ourselves. And you might say, well, Mike, how would you do that when I'm not even near the student if we're doing that remotely? Well, you might be setting the stage for reinforcement. 
if the parent is there and should be there with the student in the respective home and you're in your respective home, you might have the parent who's delivering the reinforcement and the child starts to learn that because you as the educator are showing up, that sets the stage for the student to be able to have access to the reward that they wouldn't otherwise get the rest of the week, which means you've got to have the parent on board. We might also engage in some, some fun activity. If there's a, a virtual game that you can play that's interactive with the child, a virtual game that you can incorporate the parent as well, uh, or maybe you're giving some direction and some cues to the parent to play with the child, interact with the child in some game fashion that would also build or reinforce some critical goals and objectives that are connected with the IEP. In other words, let's make it fun. If you think about yourselves, you're much more inclined to want to be with someone, engage with someone, show compliance, and feel more comfortable when you're feeling relaxed and enjoying the activity. But when we put lots of demands on students, particularly where we haven't established that good relationship, what do we see? They're digging their heels in. And then sometimes as an educator and as a parent, respectively digging their heels in, and that's where we start to see the, the heads kind of banging and we're not getting the progress we want to. So I try to look at that opportunity for good rapport building, brief periods where we're working with breaks for movement, we call those non-contingent breaks, so they don't have to earn a break to move, uh, but we want to get them moving as well. We want to give those energy breaks, preparing them for transitions, and kind of those short chunks of time so that we can help them to maximize their success. Systematic praise. So, you know, in the field, we say at least three to one, three positive for every one negative. And those praise statements should be behavior specific. I like the way you're working. I like the way you're sitting good job following the directions. That's a lot better and different than saying good girl or good boy. We wanna convey that. And likewise to the parent, thank you so much for helping your child to show up on time. Great job with helping your child to get the homework done. Provide that behavior specific praise and that can really help to shape the desired behavior. Uh, the homeschool communication or school home communication, either way you wanna look at it, is really, really critical, the collaboration. I say that having consulted with a multiple number number of schools over the last several months, that the, the more successful situations have been where there has been good, strong, consistent communication between the educator and the parent. And uh, there are challenges on both sides, we recognize that. But if you can establish what those expectations are of when the parent and educator are going to check in, and that could be the beginning of the session, it could be via email, it could be at a separate time, whatever the protocol is, have one, have a protocol for how we're gonna collaborate, when we're gonna collaborate, and what makes sense so that we can make for, again, successful educating. A little bit of transition here to what contributes to challenging behavior. So while we wanna set up for success, what are some of those factors? And hopefully most of these are pretty self-evident, but we know that many children struggle with uh, regulating their own behavior. They have developmental delays, educational delays. That's why they have an IEP and that's why they're receiving extended school year programming. Now think about some of the other factors. Many children, as well as adults, experience a significant level of distress, uh, sadness, uncertainty, anxiety, um, other mental health issues. There've been loss and, and for some individuals, some trauma as well, particularly over the last several months and continuing with individuals who may be ill just through various circumstances, not just because of COVID-19. So just being mindful of that there's lots of different factors that can really push someone's mood and behavior different than what it may have normally been in addition to the circumstances that we're living and breathing. So students may also feel disconnected and unmotivated and disaffected because they're not, again, connected with their peers. They're not seeing you in person and that's difficult. So while things have eased in the state and throughout the country, it still is quite challenging in many cases for families to feel comfortable and safe to have their child interacting with their child, with other children and with other individuals and let alone to see you if they're working remotely. So being mindful that that can contribute to challenging behavior during sessions, or if they're showing up for live sessions, and we'll certainly be seeing more and more of this, unfortunately, in September and October, is probably some 
uh, some increased spiking in, in challenging behavior as children are, com are communicating in some unhealthy ways that they're overwhelmed and they're having difficulty and they're panicky and they're, they're struggling and troubled by what's going on. And also the characteristics of the adults in the environment. What do I mean? Think about what I just described. As adults, many of us are also experiencing uncertainty and feeling disaffected and disconnected and lots of question marks and dealing with loss and grief and adjustment. So that certainly plays a role as well. So if we think about more and more, what can we do to minimize the likelihood of challenging behaviors? My recommendation would be to build in as much as you can into the ESY programming. And then also when you return back in the fall is some of those emotional regulation skills, which is kind of a fancy way of let's work on social skills. Let's work on communicating feelings. Let's help children to identify emotions. And if you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, my students know feeling words. Well, think about how many adults do you know that you, you email them or you, you text them or you have a phone call, a video you know, chat with them, you see them at live, you say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, how are you? But not really getting into truly how they're feeling and what they're experiencing. So while, we, while some children may have the language skills to effectively tell you how they're feeling, are they willing to tell you how they're feeling and take them that time? So if we operate under the assumption that there are deficits or weaknesses in communicating feelings, as well as many times a willingness to communicate feelings, well, that's a couple avenues that we can certainly work to cultivate. We can spend some dedicated time during ESY programming working on helping children to communicate feelings. Even if it's initial check-in, hey, how are you feeling? It was tough for me to get out of bed today. Gosh, I'm feeling uh, tired, right, great. Um, and I couldn't get my car started when I, I needed to go run an errand. So I was feeling what? I was feeling frustrated. Good. So we can work on that and helping children likewise to communicate how they're feeling and connecting that with the situation. And there's lots of other skills that you can build into via individual lessons as well as group instruction. I've listed just a sampling of those now, those there below, which are really what we call some of those critical skills, critical um, objectives that we want to help, essential skills for living, really, of learning to wait, accepting no, asking for help, seeking attention appropriately, showing flexibility, asking for missing items. So think about how you could coordinate that with a cooking activity or an activity you're working on math or you're working on a fine motor activity or a language arts lesson or social studies or science that we could incorporate those various skills that are maybe some of those softer skills, but the, in, in reality, some of the most critical skills, we find the many individuals that may have some of the sufficient vocational or academic skills for employment, may struggle significantly with getting and maintaining employment because of those quote unquote soft skills, those social emotional learning skills of regulating emotions, accepting no, uh, tolerating when things don't go their way, et cetera. So having a, ch a simple check-in, Hey, let's check in and see how you're feeling. How are you feeling on a scale of one to five? Are you completely happy and calm all the way up to extremely angry and frustrated? What does that look like? And can we help our students? Can we help them to be able to really incorporate two feelings? So think about this for a moment. Think about the last time you really felt frustrated, angry, disappointed, anxious. May have been today. It may have been the last couple of days when you got some news about what the summer program is going to look like. It may have been some news about something else more personally. So the idea of that I could actually feel a down feeling or a negative feeling like anger, frustration, uh, embarrassment, worry, concern, and I can stay calm and safe. For many students is a concept that they're so far from mastering and that contributes to challenging behavior. So I can be angry and my body can be calm. I can feel frustrated and my body can be calm. But for many students, again, they're, you know, they don't see that as coexisting. I'm angry, therefore I show you my anger. I'm frustrated, therefore I show that to you. But again, we want to help them to notice that. So let's notice, let's have some mindfulness, let's notice, let's be aware, let's label and identify my emotions. And at the same time, I can stay calm. How do we get there? We've got to practice. We've got to give them lots and lots of potential situations, like trigger situations. Let's write them on a card. Let's put them on a post-it note. 
and, and let's put him in a hat. Let's pull one out. Let's practice. Let's practice and practice lots of potential situations, or we could say real trigger situations that the parents share with you, that the regular school year teacher shares with you, that you anticipate or have experienced with that student. And let's practice that so that that role play or behavioral rehearsal will build up the skills for their child, kind of inoculate them so that they can be better able to manage the stress in those real life situations, therefore staying calm and in greater control. So helping to have some separation. I'm noticing, I'm thinking that I'm frustrated and that I wanna burst, but, or and, I'm gonna stay calm. I notice that I'm really, really angry and embarrassed about what just happened, and I'm gonna keep my body safe and calm. So this is really about helping the child to be more what we call psychologically flexible. Um, it's not like, you know, flexible with our arms or legs, but in our mind, we're gonna be flexible. Now I'm gonna notice my feelings and be willing to stay calm. For a child that's struggling with cognitive delays or language delays, then we would wanna use more visuals. And they may also need some, you know, some, some sensory input that's going to physically help them to move. Uh, this is not a comment uh, about sensory integration strategies. There are certainly a lot of questions in literature about the efficacy of that. I'm talking about more about movement and a place where a child can, can move with the opportunity to get calm and for a staff member, parent, when we're in the home, to help that child to process what happened, where were you, how are you feeling, uh, maybe working on some breathing, but it's a place where they can go that's kind of a haven that they can connect again with their feelings and just kind of chill for a little bit, get their body to, to kind of calm down, the heart rate to slow down, the breathing to slow down, to help them. The more we can practice, the more that's gonna happen in the real life situation. So helping them to regulate working through that. If we were live here and I could see you, I would ask you to raise your hand for how many of you have ever used video modeling so you can sort of do that on your own. And, and if you think about video modeling, well, video modeling is a, an evidence-based intervention, and one that can really be helpful for individuals that have significant needs. So if you didn't raise your hand, no, I don't use video modeling, think about whether you've ever gone onto YouTube and to seeing a video of how to make something or fix that. I've done that trying to fix the air conditioner, fix something in my car, um, rewire something. Not always successful, but by looking at something, I can learn, see the modeling, the benefit of somebody else, and then do my best to imitate that. That's called video modeling. So probably many of you have done that. So we can create a video we can show the child, they can watch us when we're doing remote learning. We could also prepare a video. We could ask the parent to prepare that. And by showing that, for example, brushing teeth or the steps for tying shoes or how to uh, tackle a math problem. So video modeling has a lot of success, not just for social, emotional, behavioral, but also for academic and vocational and motor skills. So you may think about uh, utilizing that. I mentioned before about taking some situations and putting them in a hat or container. So here's an explanation of it a bit more. It's called the situations in a hat role play. So let's take those trigger situations and put them in the hat and pull one out one at a time. And you'll see a bit more information description on that slide. What about excessive screen time? Because uh, that's a challenge. You know, if we think about having a child to be attending and showing up and minimizing some of those challenging behaviors, there's actually been a fair amount that's been even written about adults and um, you know the, the, the increased screen time that we experience and you know people uh, struggling with vision difficulties or just greater fatigue physically or in their eyes. Well, what we really want to encourage parents to do because they're going to have a couple weeks off the students between the end of the school year in many cases before ESY begins. So is to encourage parents to help their child to practice good sleep hygiene. And that should not start the, just the night before, because if we have students staying up until 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, whatever it may be, it's going to be a pretty startling change to their system to now need to go to sleep at 9 o'clock. So we may help parents to tell them to start to think about cutting back 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, gradually changing that, having no screen time at least one hour before bedtime. Also, 
exploring activities and getting kids out of the house, particularly with the nice weather here, particularly since we're able to go out more and do things. So encouraging the kids to be doing activities that don't involve screen time. I know that's an issue that kind of has been around for many, many years now, but really asking parents to commit to that, to decrease that so that when it's time to show up for remote learning, or if it's in school learning and you're utilizing a device or not use, utilizing a device, they can make those transitions a little bit more seamless so that they can move from the video off the video or off the video back onto the video. So having some real clear limits and expectations, I think is gonna be important so that you can, um, you can experience that success. Mask wearing. Well, there's a lot to be said about this in our short period of time. I'm just gonna mention a couple of things that could be incorporated into, um, into extended school year programming. There's been, been some really good webinars that people have presented just on mask wearing. But my recommendations would be, depending upon what specific guidelines will exist in your respective school, is that we know that the mask wearing, uh, at least we hear the mask wearing is a real critical component and that we're required to wear that in many uh, places. So helping the child to understand the need to wear a mask and where they'll need to wear a mask and having them practice that. So learning those rules and conveying that to the parents and helping the child to understand that. It could be some visuals of pictures where the child will wear the mask and where they won't be wearing a mask for when they return in September. Will they wear a mask when they're in the cafeteria? Well, maybe so, but then removing it when they're eating. Are they wearing a mask in the classroom? What about the hallways? What about gym class? What about the restroom? So the more you can learn that over the next couple months, the more that could be incorporated into ESY to teach them, here's where we wear a mask, here's where we don't wear a mask. And what about the social cues? So I can sit here and you can see different facial expressions that I have, and likewise with your kids, when you're providing the remote learning. But when we're wearing a mask, we're gonna lose a lot of that. And likewise, that the child's wearing a mask. So we think about the difficulty that many students have with picking up on social cues already and picking up on facial cues. They see an eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, but they don't get much meaning from that. And now we're gonna put a mask on them and there's even less that they can get from that. It becomes more challenging for communication and emotional regulation. So um, perhaps that's something that we could uh, we could teach them as part of an activity. We could be doing an activity where without a mask, I'm going to show you a facial expression. You've got to guess, am I smiling or am I not smiling? Or am I sad or am I angry? And then I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to put a mask on, and now you need to guess how am I feeling. I want the child to do the same thing. I want to see, can I tell now, attend a little bit more to the eyes and the eyebrows and the cheeks. What does it look like when that child is displaying that emotion? And what does the child see when I'm displaying that emotion? I think that's one of those areas that we're becoming more and more cognizant about. But just think about that when you go throughout, you know, in a store or somewhere else in public, can you tell the facial expression, how that person is feeling if you can't see half of their face? So it's a skill that we can work on helping a child to communicate a little bit more their feelings and to be able to help them to be a better detective socially at how people may be feeling when they're not using their words. So that becomes important. What about healthy mind and body, right? So we know that in general, this is really important. What I would encourage you as part of your instruction remotely, as well as if you're going to be inside or whenever we're returning, so if we can encourage parents to participate, to help their child to be moving around, uh, the idea of not only taking breaks, but to be engaging in some regular exercise. So I would recommend making that part of the activities during ESY instruction. That could also be some quote unquote generalization or homework activities where the child needs to go for a walk with a parent or doing some jumping jacks, obviously health and medical issues um, taking into consideration so that we can help the child to get back to some exercise that for many individuals, perhaps they haven't been doing for three months, right? If they've been staying inside, haven't had phys ed class, slowly getting them back to stretching their body, moving their body, and safely doing that so that it's not such a shock when they actually are running outside or when they return to school during phys ed class. So try to incorporate that. Socialization. Gosh, we know that's really challenging. 
becomes a little bit easier, yet still with some, you know, reasonable concerns that we have as we move on. So one of the things you could try to address is some of the shyness and anxiety that might exist in turn taking or participating. And I've seen that with a number of students and heard that from educators and parents that a student who otherwise was much better able to socialize in person has really kind of gone uh, quiet during remote learning. So if we can engage them, let's go back to that pairing and the rapport building to get them engaged in an activity that's fun, kind of giving them the softball questions so that they can participate and increase their confidence. Confidence doesn't occur because we're a good cheerleader. Confidence occurs because someone is experiencing success and success again and again. And that becomes impactful because over time, their confidence actually does increase because they've achieved that success, not because we've told them that they can do well. So you might find that if we utilize some things like conversation starters, hey, I went somewhere really cool this weekend. Yeah, kind of have that 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 pause where there's nothing that's happening. So can we coach our kids to think about, well, what are some comments? Well, that's cool. I went there too. Um, yeah, I'd love to go somewhere else. That, that would be nice to go. Or some of the questions like who, what, when, where, why, how, you know, kinds of questions, can questions. So we can get just kind of that engine moving in the child's mind. Mm, who did you go with? Where did you go? What kind of food did you eat? Now, I went to a great place for, for dinner and we sat outside on Saturday. Hmm. Oh, who did you go with? Where did you go? So again, helping the kids to build up that social language by giving them some of the tools is another great way that you can be incorporating during ESY programming. You could also build together some of the, the functional skills, the daily living skills at whatever age, together with academic skills and communication socialization. So we could be doing a baking activity. So it could be, we're gonna be baking you know, something, we're gonna be cooking something, and obviously being mindful of any allergens and, and being mindful of you know, what's the type of food that we're making. But you let the parents know in advance, here's where we're gonna be cooking the second week and I'll be making it here and you can help your child to prepare the table, help your child to, we're gonna follow the recipe, we're gonna have some visuals, maybe the child is going to, um, measure out the different items and they're going to be involved from literally soup to nuts so that we can be making uh, that together and working on socialization and then it's going to be like a show and share let's share what we've made let's talk about that let's maybe talk about the ingredients we could read together we there are also lots of virtual tours that are online since many places are still closed and would make it difficult for us to get there um, carrying on that idea of socialization if you're not familiar with castle and this you'll find on New Jersey Department of Ed's website or castle.org, the value of social emotional learning. So I've touched on some of these and you see in this wheel here, the critical skills going clockwise of self-awareness, of responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, uh, self-management. Any way that you can incorporate these skills during ESY is gonna have a tremendous impact. Uh, research supports that we see at least an 11 point improvement, 11 percentage point improvement academically among learners when they receive social emotional learning. So just by working on social emotional learning, we're actually increasing their academic skills. There's so much connection there if you think about social problem solving and building up their awareness skills and their communication skills and perspective taking. So working on that um, is really key and I would encourage you to incorporate that. That idea of the social emotional learning and climate is critical. One of Maya Angelou's uh, quotes, which is one of my favorite, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. That's important at all times. It's, it's even more important with all of the different things that we're experiencing in this world. And especially important if we think about what's right in front of you with ESY and helping our students to feel engaged and connected and cared for. And likewise for parents, for parents to feel that they're engaged and connected and with you and, and that you care for them and you understand and respect what their needs and challenges are by asking them and working together. What about generalization? So how can we help the kids to generalize even more? So there's actually some really good research that talks about that if we're working on social skills, for example, that 
students who have activities to work on generalization outside of whatever you're doing in your group show twice the improvement of those that don't do that. So as much as kids may not want to get homework, and maybe we need to call it something other than homework, maybe it's going to be um, you know, the, the fun practice activity, you can come up with a name, maybe even the kids come up with the, the name of the activity, but something we're going to work on outside of our actual lesson and bring back during the summer that's going to be fun and engaging, but knowing that that's going to increase skills twofold by having that practice. Let me shift with uh, the few minutes that we have before we get into some Q&A and talk a little bit about self-care. And there's lots of different ways that we can talk about self-care. Self-care for yourselves, self-care for those with whom you're working. So if you're here showing up as a parent, maybe it's for the educators. If it's an educator, maybe it's for the parent or other educators, or just thinking about yourself and your family members, or for our students. So what I want you to think about is to be mindful, and we call that present moment awareness, to really have a, a good sense of noticing your stress. We're gonna give that a little bit of distance because then it's, when it's right here, when it's right kind of at your forehead, you can't see, you can't see past that. You wouldn't be able to drive a car. You wouldn't be able to walk without crashing into things. You wouldn't be very productive if all of your stress is right here. So we're gonna kind of have an awareness and, and move it over a little bit so that I can then take care of myself and give that some distance. So notice what you might be experiencing and that a lot of it is probably pretty normal that this can be stressful, this can be difficult. And just by having that thought doesn't mean that you're incapacitated. I can say, I can't raise my hand while raising my hand. I can say, I can't run in the cold while I'm running in the cold. And you can say, gosh, teaching during ESY remote learning is really, really difficult. I can't do it while you're doing it. So be kind to yourself when we think about self-care and start the week, you know, start every day with self-care. And there's lots of different ways that we can do that. And there's some examples here of going for a walk and taking a breath and caring for your own health and, and physical and emotional needs. What I'd really recommend is you carve out specific time for yourself and recommend that you share this with parents and for them to share this with their child and work on this with their child. So dedicate time yourself. When am I going to exercise on the treadmill? Put that in your calendar like nobody's business. I'm not going to let anything else get in the way of that. My appointment for myself is at this time, this is when I'm gonna exercise and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna to stick to it. What about socially? Well, I'm gonna have a virtual breakfast or remote breakfast. Well now, okay, I guess we can sit outside and we can be at a restaurant and we can sit outside with enough distance and we'll I'll have breakfast or lunch with a friend of mine or dinner with a family member. I wanna socialize and as we can, things have eased and eased up. I can do that now more live with others, but I'm gonna dedicate that time because I know that's important for my well-being. Emotionally, maybe I need to keep a journal and be reflective. And I'm gonna do that after I brush my teeth, before I get into bed, every night for five minutes, just some notes in my journal. I wanna be contemplative and think about and reflective about how am I thinking, how am I feeling, what's going on? What about workplace? So you probably have done a ton of collaborating via email, text, Zoom chats, whatever it would be with colleagues, right? And we'll be doing more and more of that, I'm certain, as you're getting into ESY and contemplating again what it looks like returning back in September. But dedicating time to consult with, to collaborate with a peer who's in the same field, I think that can be really helpful in carving out that time. The thought diary, as I noted, um, as well can be helpful. So um, choosing that while you may not like what the reality is of the situation for ESY or return to school, I'm just not going to reject the reality. The reality is this can be challenging, this can be uncertain, and I'm going to accept it. Not embracing it because I love it, but accepting and allowing room for it. What I would encourage you also, like we said for, for our students, is to make sure that you're practicing to kind of minimize or protect against what we call compassion fatigue. You think of it like the meter. Meter, you know, in your car, your fuel gauge. When there's less and less gas, your car's not running real, you know, well. And when there's no more gas in the car, then the car is going to stop. So your compassion is the same way. When you're burned out and you've got nothing left there, you've got nothing left to give for others or for yourself. So make sure you have sufficient 
sleep, make sure that you're well rested, make sure that you're exercising and eating well, and you're taking care of your self-care, as I just noted. Um, when you're dedicating time for yourself, you've got to say no to other things. In other words, if I'm scheduling time, committing to, I'm going to go for a run today. If I say yes to anything else, in effect, I've said no to my run. And then I've said no to my own self-care. So if you absolutely have to move something that's on your calendar for your self-care, then you've got to reschedule that ASAP to be mindful of yourself and to be kind to yourself. But generally, say no to things that would impede or impact what you've dedicated for yourself for your self-care. And that, of course, can be challenging. Uh, a couple other tips before we, we entertain some Q&A. Uh, I hear people sometimes say, well, I feel guilty dedicating time for myself. I feel guilty setting aside time for exercising because, gosh, I haven't spent enough time with my family and my friends. Well, if you haven't stolen something or lied or cheated, then let's try to avoid the word guilty. You know, what you probably are feeling is conflicted. You might be feeling concerned or worried, and maybe you need to express that to loved ones and friends. And the reality is that you can be working out and noticing that you're feeling a bit concerned or worried. You can be taking, you know, a warm bath. You can be going for a walk or talking with a friend and also noticing, oh gosh, um, I'm not spending my time with my family during this time. And then communicate that to them and schedule that time. So just because you have a thought about something doesn't mean that we have to stop doing that. And that's something we can convey to our students and parents as well, because parents may feel guilty that I haven't done this or I haven't done that. Kids may feel you know, frustrated that they've got to show up for ESY when they'd like to be outside, okay? We can show up for ESY and feel frustrated and feel tired. So just because we're feeling something doesn't mean we can't also still engage in the necessary activity. So try to set some boundaries so that you can commit to those times. Uh, again, being kind to yourself. Um, the last couple slides talk about that same kind of idea of connecting our thoughts and feelings with what we can do. I want to help educate my students. I want to work with parents. I want to be the best educator or parent I can be. And it's awfully difficult. It's awfully challenging, awfully concerning at times. So we think about this Helen Keller slide to wrap up with. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. I think that's critical, not just in the COVID pandemic that we continue to deal with, but you know, the greater um, global issues and, and national issues we're dealing with. And then very specifically with what we're looking at with ESY to be able to look at that, hey, we can collaborate here and have some good planning to make a difference. Um, our timing is uh, pretty close to exactly where we're going to be, just about four o'clock, Barbara, and I'm uh, yeah. pleasantly uh, surprised that I got through it. Uh, with Excellent. a couple of minutes to spare and now we're gonna we're gonna entertain some questions which i'm happy yeah. to answer so hopefully so uh thank you. as soon as possible can hang on for another 15 minutes and we'll sure. entertain the questions i think we're we're good and our our timing is perfect because um uh you're right on 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 time oh I do have a question um about the situation that some districts are facing that some of the students with the most significant disabilities obviously are having the toughest time engaging and their parents are sort of and you talked about it so frustrated that they're saying forget it we don't we don't want to do this do you have any um any suggestions for districts about how to deal with this well, I suppose uh, there, there are several challenging components that are connected with that. Uh, I'm going to do my best to stay away from the legal piece because I think there's yeah. so many different kind of tentacles there, Barbara, not, right? But, right, not legal, just help. <laughs> you know, I, I think what I find consistently is really, really important when parents feel like they're, they've ready, they're ready to check out or they have checked out is uh, reestablishing that communication and 
uh, really truly validating and you may feel like well what is that going to do and i think what we find uh, and i'll touch on at least at this level in terms of you know when issues occur and, and when sometimes there are complaints and due process so many times it's because parents may not feel that they've been validated and heard and the communication has been there so i would really encourage um, you know as educators to make sure that we're connecting with parents and and to acknowledge, we recognize how difficult this is. You know, please share with me, what can I do to make a difference during remote learning, during ESY, whatever that looks like, understanding that this is absolutely not the ideal, recognizing that you've already been through this March, April, May, into halfway into June. What can I do to align myself with you, to work with you, to help your child? What can we decide together that's gonna to make a meaningful difference? Because you're right, Barbara, that with regard to the question that's asked, we could have a learner that has significant behavior issues, significant oppositional behavior, not wanting to show up. So what can we do? And in some cases, I've recommended to parents um, and to the teacher, the teacher could almost be like a commentator with the parent trying to engage the child in some preferred activity, and the, and, and the, the teacher's kind of talking to the parent, giving them some guidance that was pre-established about how to support that child and going through some preferred activity and giving some of the coaching to the parent may actually go a long way of building the parent's confidence helping to get the child engaged in some meaningful activity even though it's not what the teacher intended to be teaching during that time okay well thank you um mike you've answered so many of the important questions today that i think we're going to Wait, I think I just mistake. So I want to uh, put my video on so that I can thank you for, for this incredibly useful, valuable information, um, because it's so critical that we are able to engage and have our students with the most significant disabilities participate successfully in their programs and in the ESY. So I wanna thank you very much. We're great on time. And I wanna thank all of the participants for joining us. And we will, again, as I said, be sending you the information tomorrow with a copy of the PowerPoint and a link to the video. So thank you again for joining us and thank you so much, Dr. Selps, for all this valuable information. And it's uh, one, <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Once again, my pleasure. Thank you, Barbara and Donna and uh, Sal. Again, I appreciate your help in the technology side. Thank you everybody for participating. I wish you um, safe, healthy and, and enjoyable summer. If you have some questions, do feel free to reach out to me on my email, you'll see on the PowerPoint. So be well and thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you so much.